from Dr. Rumpersal. He's my supervisor at LDL. Uh, he did his uh, undergraduate studies at Darmstadt University in Germany. Um, then he came to the US to work for his PhD from, uh, well, he was actually at Frankfurt University, but he did his work uh, here at LDL in quantum computing. And then he became a staff scientist at LDL. Um, now he's working with um, accelerators, mostly ion accelerators, and neutron generators together with gamma tech. Uh, he works for the Accelerator Technology and Applied Physics Division, this ATAP group. And today we're going to hear about measuring carbon in soil distribution using an associated particle imaging system, um, which is the project that is also part of my piece. So, without further ado, please welcome. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, yeah, I mean, my voice will probably put, might be able to give the talk better than I do because he does uh, most of the work. Um, uh, here we go. So uh, we're going to talk a bit about the project we have, and as uh, most of you mentioned, it's, uh, the idea is to measure carbon distribution in soils. So it's uh, um, using nuclear um, techniques. And so I'm just going to talk a bit about the overview, and then uh, what we have at the lab, uh, some simulation results, and then uh, just go over what, what we do in our project. So this is a this is a team of people we have. Uh, there's myself. Uh, I'm the PI. Uh, the biggest scientist at LBL, uh, Mauricio, and uh, Will, who was in the audience. He's a school um, intern at the moment. Uh, he actually knows something about soil, which I don't. Uh, and then we work together with a group of earth scientists uh, who bring that knowledge for, soil, for soils uh, into our into this project. So we have uh, Owen, uh, Caitlin, she's now at Dartmouth, and, and Christina, they're all in our earth sciences. And then we have a, an industry partner in the project. Um, uh, they, it's a company called Healthfire Technology, they're, they're just across the bay, uh, and their bread and butter is to make nuclear generators, mostly EV nuclear generators. Uh, uh, but they also make an associated particle imaging system, which is a DT generator, uh, we'll go more about uh, later, and so we're using their system uh, in, our, in our setup. And just to motivate it a bit, so there's, um, um, so now I'm getting into a bit into soil science, which I don't really know much about, so I'm just going to go with the slides that the, uh, my colleague gave me, but it's um, so, so the one issue is that like over the over the last uh, few thousand years, uh, when people started using more agriculture, uh, there's a lot of uh, carbon loss in soil. So it's in the, in the hundreds of petagrams uh, of, of soil, and you can see like uh, most of the most of the loss is like when, when I things become industrial, and you, you really lost a lot of um, carbon out of the soil. And so um, in principle. If one could find a way to put the carbon back, there would be a huge potential for a carbon sink. And you could, uh, you could, uh, you could really uh, help like uh, global warming a bit uh, or I mean, fighting it. So there's a large potential to putting um, mitigate fossil fuel emission by uh, having better soil management or putting carbon actually back into the soil. And if you just uh, increase um, uh, soil organic carbon by like a small percent per year in, in the soils, so then normally the concentration is on percent levels, you could offset like 20 to 35 percent of the global emission. So as I said earlier, there's a big potential. Um, the problem is if you just put the carbon back, um, I don't know, like you bury some roots or like organic matter, like my my is gone, um, and they uh, they decompose it, and normally you get CO2 that goes just straight out of the soil again. So it's not that easy to put carbon back in there. But one issue is that you, um, there's no good tool of measuring at the moment. Like the best best way of measuring at the moment is to take the core samples, and then you burn the you burn those samples and measure the CO2, and um, that makes it really hard to like make reproducible measurements over like time series over the same same area. So here's um, Christina like doing a um, doing a core taking a core sample. You can see like, it goes quite quite far down and it's like hard work. And uh, once you have them out, then you also don't really know. You have to know the bike density to get the carbon concentration. That's what you really want. And in the end, you, you use small samples because you don't want to analyze like the whole core that you have. So, I mean, Take a small sample out of that core to, to, um, to get your data, and so like uh, there's another issue is that like uh, the carbon distribution changes a lot over uh, over distance from the I mean, if you measure like a meter away, like you might get completely different uh, results. So it's hard to like really get uh, to, to large scale um, maps of carbon in soil. And so that's partly of the challenge of what uh, what we're trying to solve. And so um, what we what we're doing is the uh, I mean, the goal of the project is to come up with an instrument 
that, that I can do this non-destructive, and so you can do repeatable measurement. And we want to get the, the, the carbon distribution here with like a resolution of several centimeters, and up to a depth of let's say 30 centimeters. Uh, and then um, it should be a field portable system at the end. Uh, so at the moment, what people do, they kind of take a shovel, they call it shovel omics, and then uh, just like uh, measure the depth. And what we want to end up is something like here. This is a picture of a, of a prototype of a mass rover, but something mobile that you could, in uh, principle, uh, use in the field. And it could be on a truck, or it could be something. It doesn't have to be like be larger than this, but something that you can do field measurements with. Um, and so the way we want to do it is we want to use neutrons for this. So there's a uh, inelastic neutron scattering. So uh, we want to produce neutrons here in a, in a, in a small point source uh, using um, the DT fusion reaction, where you get a neutron and an alpha. Uh, they go in all directions, but uh, if you place an alpha detector like uh, on top of here, you're sensitive to like certain alphas. And then from the position, if you, if you know the position where the alpha hits, and you have a point source, you can you can go back and figure out the direction of the neutron. <coughs> and that's what's called uh, that's the associated particle imaging, because the alpha is the associated particle of the neutron here. And so then you get this cone of neutrons that go into like your target area uh, that you're now sensitive to. And all the other neutrons that go in the other directions, uh, you're just not sensitive to. And uh, since the detector are uh, expensive, I mean, like they're somewhat expensive, and you have to integrate them, into your, um, your generator normally because the uh, alphas don't really can't get them out of the vacuum tubes. Uh, so it's you have restricted to certain sizes here normally of the alpha detector. It's hard to make this really large areas uh, and get high resolution. So um, by having this 50 centimeter above the ground, we get an hour set up to roughly 50 centimeters down here. So that's where like the size on the, on the ground comes from. Uh, and then um, the neutron can enter the soil, can do all kinds of nuclear reaction. One of them is inelastic neutron scattering. But the neutron just scatters off of, the, for example, the carbon here, it excites the carbon, and when it de-excites, you get a gamma out that you can measure this detectors above ground. And so all your detectors and everything lives above ground, you don't have to disturb the soil, and you, um, uh, you can measure the energy of these gammas, and from that you can figure out which element it was. And by doing time of flight between the gamma and the alpha here, like so you, have, uh, so you create your DT, neutron and the alpha, the alpha goes this way, the neutron comes down here, and the gamma comes back. By doing time of flight measurements, you can get the depths of where this happened, and you have the direction from the alpha detector. And so, so then you have a 3D coordinate in, in the soil, and there are all kinds of um, errors that you can have that make your uh, that gives you like a, your resolution that you can get here. One of them is the timing measurements. So like um, the slowest particle here is a neutron, just roughly uh, five centimeters per nanosecond. That's a 14 MeV neutron, and so if you measure up to the one nanosecond position, let's say, you you get a Resolution here of five centimeters in depth, and so that's that's kind of what we're aiming for to get to get to one nanosecond and then five centimeter depth. And it turns out like if you go look at X and Y and you look what kind of beam spot size you have and what kind of resolution you can get up here, that five centimeter in X and Y is also like a good good number to get to. So that's where like our, our the, the main numbers come from. And uh, it's not a new technique. I mean we have invented this. We're just applying it to like a, to these agricultural problems now. That's a, that's a goal. Project. So the, what, the, what you want to do is you want to mostly take uh, commercially available systems and integrate them, mm -hmm. work on the data the analysis, the data acquisition to like to, to figure out what the carbon concentration is in the soil. So our system is a uh, relatively simple. I mean, it's a DT neutron generator. So we have a microwave plasma source in here. Uh, and the, it's a sealed source. So the vacuum chamber is filled with deuterium and tritium. Uh, there's a small getter where they live in, like uh, so it's all gathered up, and then you heat up the getter, you release it with the electricity mixture, and uh, uh, you put microwaves in here, in our case roughly 200 watts of microwave power, generates a nice plasma, and then you have one extraction electrode that also does focusing at the same time. Uh, you apply, at the moment you're applying around 80 kilovolts, but you could go up to like 100 in this design, uh, and you get a beam out that gets focused to a small beam spot size on a titanium target. That you implant your deuterium tritium, and then following ions can hit those and create a fusion reaction, and roughly that beam energy. And then you get lots of neutrons, um, mostly DT neutrons, because the cross section is the highest. So you also get, you have your beam is 50% deuterium and tritium, you get DD and TT, and, uh, you get also D on T and T on D, which um, makes small differences in the, in the center of mass, like how it moves. So it will give you like slightly different angular distributions. 
but in first order that doesn't really matter to us that much. So because the cross section for dt is roughly n times higher than dd, mostly what we get is dt neutrons. Uh, and so the moment components are the vision generator, which is a commercial unit, the alpha detector, which is somewhat integrated in here, so we, we put a scintillator in here. Uh, we have another slide on that later. Uh, gamma detectors, we have a lanthanum bromide and a sodium iodide detector, like a 5 inch sodium iodide and a 3 inch lanthanum bromide. Uh, and then a data acquisition system that takes care of uh, reading the data. And then we also did quite a bit of simulations at one point. Um, I showed some results of it. This is Gen 4 a bit. Mostly we do MCMP uh, and some console for the alpha detector up here. And we run those like a MCMP mostly on a cluster at the lab. Uh, project we have is a three year project. And we're roughly halfway. So um, first year was a lot of uh, simulations, design uh, studies, figuring out what we want to buy, uh, the detectors we want to buy, how we want to read our data detector, um, worrying about weight limitations uh, and uh, energy resolutions and things like this. Uh, then we, we bought all this equipment. And it took a long time to the right, because like many of these things have long lead times. So we had the, I think the longest one was like six or I guess the last one was a mission generator, which took like nine months uh, until they delivered it. Uh, should have been much faster, but they, was, like, they had some problems with one of their vendors, and then it just it takes a long time for these things to build and test. So that was the one we built, a, the end we built a prototype um, in, the, in the lab, so we can do lab experiments. So we now we are in, in year two, um, where we do these lab experiments. So we have like the first data I can show you later. Um, Hopefully, like in a, within a month, we have like most of the hardware figured out, and then we really want to focus for the rest of the project on the, on, on the analysis of the data and like getting a good algorithm to get our carbon distribution out of that. Uh, and then part of the project goal is um, uh, is to take the instrument into the field in the third year and do some measurements of real soil samples. So there's um, like over here, I showed like an example of a group from uh, in Alabama. They also use neutrons. Um, they do also do an elastic scattering, but they don't. Don't do API, so they only they get 90% of the signals or 95% of the signals from the first few inches in the soil, so they're completely dominated by the surface layers. Um, but they, otherwise, they're, they're kind of doing it. Uh, they just don't have the other detector to get the, to be able to get this additional information. Uh, this is our system here, so that's a neutron generator here. Um, our government detectors are down here, some shielding, and this is just a neutron detector that we have. Uh, we had to design some boards for the other detector readout. This is our other detector, it's a Hamamatsu 60 by 60 pixel um, a photomultiplier that, uh, that we use to measure the position of the alpha particle. So here's a simulated spectrum from uh, early on in the project. And you can see there are all kinds of lines that we should expect. Uh, somewhere in there is a 4.4 MeV carbon line. That's the one we have in. Uh, depending which slide we use in the simulations, you also see that like uh, oxygen should give you a line here, which would mess us up a bit. But, um, principle there are other lines we should be able to see oxygen, carbon, iron, um, silicon, and uh, you might you might see if you can measure hydrogen too. Uh, perhaps you have to pulse our hydrogen generator for that, but we'll it'll, it'll see. But uh, water content is one of the big concerns we have. So if you have water in your soil you get neutron information and uh, that will mess up your neutron flux and then uh, be able to figure out what your carbon concentration is you need to know your neutron flux quite well. So that's one of the challenges we have. Uh, like after a lot of simulation at the beginning, we did, we uh, we decided that we could uh, did some, some uh, we did some studies like how long would it take to do a, a measurement. So it depends on how many carbon you have in there. So if you have one percent carbon in the soil and you want to measure it uh, within 0.2 uh, percent, you need to update like 10 to 10, 10, 10 minutes to half an hour, I would say. And it also depends on like where and the depth. Like the deeper you go, the, the less neutrons you get. You get neutron scattering and just like further away from the neutron source, and the gammas are further away from the detector, so it just it takes longer if you go further down. Um, so one thing you can do, you can make your voxels larger when you go down, and so here's some numbers for different voxel sizes and different depths uh, and how long it will take. Um, this all assumes like a, uh, like the two detectors um, that we have, like in principle, if you it's our baseline system here, we have a neutron generator that produces up to one e eight newtons per second. I mean, probably push to 2e8, that correlates in like this many, many alphas on your detector. Uh, and uh, at the moment, uh, for the baseline system, we have these two detectors that we actually have. The stretch goal would be to add more detectors to it, and then a commercial product would probably add uh, a lot more detectors around it, especially to get more uh, 
information for the deeper layers. And there you might be able to get away with sodium iodide because uh, all of the time you lose is not that good. If you, if you go down, make the boxes larger, you, you, um, you can relax your restriction for your timing the requirements a bit for, um, for the detectors. So this is what we came up in the end for, the, for our project. That's the performance per goals. So we want to measure 50 by 50 by 30 centimeters. The surface we aim for like 5 centimeter. At the deeper layers, we want to have slightly larger pixels. And we, will be able, we want to be able to measure 0.21%, just like a 0.1% precision. And we want to get it so that if you, if you would then scale it to a commercial project, that you would have 10 minutes measurement time. That's kind of the challenge that we set ourselves. And then we'll see, we'll see if you get there. So um, at LBL we have a test stand like where we allowed to run neutrons. So it's this hutch here. It's in the basement. So like two walls to side have like soil on the outside, so they're pretty well shielded. And then on the other two walls we have lots of um, poly shielding, roughly um, I would say four inches of poly and a, and a flat shielding. So we're allowed to run up to like two times ten to the eight uh, DT neutrons in there. Uh, and um, so that's where we set everything up. We have this is our table in there. So it's a neutron generator again. Detectors sit down here, and then we have an area we can put targets in here. And then our control station is a bit further away, so just to keep a bit more distance. Um, obviously, there's a lot of simulation for our radiation safety guys, so here you can see uh, those in milliamp power. Um, this is the shielding wall, and most of the doors is nicely closed inside. And also, like, we have a, luckily, we have a pretty thick cement wall on top because on the top there's a, a bit of uh, so there's a high bay that's filled with like one large uh, accelerator, which which weighs a lot. So like we like we have a pretty thick thick floor there that kind of saved us. So like uh, we don't measure anything on the top here. And just as a teaser, so like this is like a spectrum we measured recently in December, where we can actually see like the carbon peaks and some other elements from the tester with our lens chroma detector. Um, so in, in September we got our uh, generator. So we did our first yield curve measurement. We just scaled up the voltages. Uh, at the moment, we don't have a, it's not calibrated yet, so we haven't really had time to do that yet. Um, but this is roughly what we would expect. Um, and we know we are we end up in of the order of 1 to the 8, um, or up here, let's say 1 to the 7 newtons per second. Um, because like these, these are somewhat calibrated from, from our um, environmental health department, but they're not, uh, it's not a perfect calibration. So they then only spill out milliamps per hour. The neutron generator itself is a plasma based neutron generator. So here's a picture of it. It's roughly, I would say, from here to here, it's perhaps uh, 50 centimeters. Uh, so the whole system has two feet. Uh, in this case, they have like a microwave uh, generator right on here. We have a, actually we have a solid state microwave generator now. That we just have a cable coupling in here. Um, this is the main, in, in here is the plasma chamber. The plasma chamber is, uh, is biased to positive voltage. So we're actually uh, biasing the, the, the ion source so that we can have the target on ground. Because like when the ions hit the target, you create lots of cyclic electrons, and you don't want them to be accelerated uh, to any high voltages. So there's a so you, it's nice to be able to keep this on ground, and there's a shroud in here that protects the like the high voltage area from cyclic electrons. So it, like a, only a very small amount of electrons can make it back, like kind of on the same beam axis where the beam comes in. Uh, it's just like something you can really hard to shield. Uh, and then there's a window on here where you can put our alpha detector. So on the inside, we're putting a, a scintillator so that they convert the alphas into light. And then we measure the light uh, on the outside of the vacuum uh, system with a normal scintillator. And the target is just a, a small small piece of titanium. It's actually a cover piece that's coated with a kind of micrometer titanium. So that we can, and it's cool, it's actually cool. So it's not, not a lot of power in the system because we don't need them. Um, uh, you know, I mean, these ion salts can, can produce a lot more current than what we need. So we're running it at a few microamps, which is pretty low. But that gives us the neutron output that we need in the DT neutrons. And um, yeah, so the beam spot size is roughly two millimeter, or smaller than two millimeter, which is the maximum. Um, and they promise us like two thousand hours of operations. And so far, it's been working quite well. Um, so the alpha detector, we'll talk a bit about that one. It's, uh, as I said, like there's alpha, uh, we, we use YAP as a scintillator. Uh, then we have a small uh, vacuum gap here, and then there's a vacuum window. In our case, we use sapphire. Um, we use sapphire because it's, um, it, 
makes that window, you can make that window pretty thin, so ours is only three millimeter thick. Uh, it's just more, I mean, the other alternative would be a quartz window, and that would be probably two or three times the thickness. Um, and you get just, uh, as you can see from the simulation, that you get lots of photons here, and then you get lots of internal reflection, but a small bone of, of photons will make it out. And, uh, uh, and then we have our pixelated PMT, like each pixel is three millimeters roughly. So it's a 16 by 16 array, so five centimeters by five centimeters. And with the spread that we have here, like you get, if you look from the top and you just look at like a small subset of these 16 by 16 array, like in this case, four by four, like this is roughly how our beam score looks like. And so we want to spread it across several pixels because then we can do a sub-pixel, uh, like, I don't know, center of mass, for example. You can reconstruct where your center is uh, and you get sub-pixel resolution, which is what we need. We need to um, get to five centimeter on the ground, we need like a better than a millimeter resolution here. Uh, and uh, so we did a lot of simulation if we can achieve it and it looked quite good um, and, and other people measured some uh, did similar setups. Um, standard is often that people use zinc oxide here and you, uh, the problem then is like you, you get, it's faster but it gets you less, less light. And if you don't have, a, the nice thing about the yak is you can get a pretty large crystal so we have actually we have five centimeter crystal so we don't have to, um, if you have a powder you get lots of loss at the, the crystal boundaries and so you uh, lose even more light. And, and so that's that's kind of the reason why we went for, for this one. And then we also do, to get a bit more light out, we, we, we coat the back side with aluminum, so we have a mirror surface on the back, and that just kind of doubles your light output in the front. Um, and uh, <coughs> yeah, you get something like this, you digitize it, uh, and there are several ways of digitizing it, we'll talk about later. So we use something which uh, reads out four corners out of these uh, 16 by 16 array. Uh, and then we go into our digitizer, which is a, in our case an XIA, 16 channel 500 megahertz digitizer, and we from there uh, reconstruct our position. Um, this is in principle what we thought we would see, and it's pretty much also what we're seeing. So like, if you have a single photon response, that's pretty, fa that's pretty fast, and you get 300, 600 photons, that's what we expect to get, so then you add them all up, it's like a, uh, they have like an exponential distribution. You get signals that look like this. If you have the more photons you get, the smoother your signal will look like. Um, and then if you uh, if you look at roughly the rate uh, you expect, but we got eight newtons per second, we expect one times uh, 27 alphas per second. You can already see like you get a uh, lot of pileup. Uh, since it's very noisy because of the photon statistics that we have here, it's for example here more or less impossible to like figure out where you uh, where your timing of your alpha is. And then if you want to correlate a gamma with it, that arrives like 20 milliseconds later then you also you get rate limits and, and so that's one of the reasons why in API you can't really push it to like as high as a fusion rate as you want to because you have to wait for your grammar to come back and then you have the coincidences so you want to have a window where there's nothing else happening in that time. Um, but already like this is a simulated spectrum so like, you can see like this is when the when the event happens and then you, you just add it up like random uh, random events of these just uh, random numbers. And uh, some of them will be pretty challenging to to detect. We, you have to throw stuff away and then you can go to the mass and have a plot of it later and it shows you roughly where you want to operate. Um, so here's a metal trace from our other detector. It actually looks quite good. It looks uh, a bit smoother than this. This is a simulated trace for 600 photons. But that's uh, because we also go through a filter before we go into our uh, digitizer that's not included down here. So they look uh, uh, relatively similar. So like, um, we're pretty confident that our simulation is a bit at the beginning. Uh, um, okay, what you want, and uh, you have a pretty sharp rise time, uh, fall time of uh, the YAP really has two components, which is kind of an average rise time, and we get decent amplitudes for digitization. Uh, so we're quite happy with it. And then uh, one of the main points is how do you read out the position? And there's several ways of doing it. Uh, so you have this array, like uh, I'm only plotted 4 by 4 but we have a 16 by 16 array here, uh, and you can in principle think of uh, lots of schemes how to read it out. What people have done before is they use four corners, so they somehow connect, connect all these pixels together, and there's several ways of how you can do this. This is one way, we just connect rows. So you put a resistor between each of these uh, pixels. Uh, so you get these uh, 16 rows in our case, and then you put a resistor also between each row on the outside, and you get four corners on. So if an alpha particle hits here, you get a uh, higher signal on C than on B, for example, and then by taking ratio between C and B, you can figure out where on this uh, axis that the, the, the position is, like an x and y coordinate. And, and that's how we're doing it at the moment. Uh, one issue, one drawback of this is that if you, the particle hits here, you, get, you see it on all four corners. Like the signal goes to all four corners, 
once we have pure pileup issues, uh, this will definitely be a problem because like it's every I mean every signal gets to every channel. But you only need four channels, which is nice because digitizers cost money, and uh, um, and the more digitizers you have, the more complex it gets to read them all out. So so we went to this for the to start, but we also want to try out other points. So another option is a uh, called a row and column readout, where you just have you have a digitizer for each row and for each column. You get some cross talk between them because like a signal that goes down here can also go down like this way and then down here. Um, but uh, otherwise you do the same thing. You have like small resistors between them and so you just add up the columns and the rows. Uh, now your the product that's here it, it will occupy like perhaps two or three of these digitizers, but the other ones are still uh, are ready to go. So you can you have a higher rate by a factor of five. So, um, so that's something that we, we want to explore and we're just making boards for this. And then the best way would just be to digitize every pixel. Uh, but then you need a lot of digitizers. So you need, like in our case, you need 256. Uh, and they all have their good time resolution and uh, it was just not in our budget. And uh, you probably could, uh, I mean, if you want to do it, uh, I mean, the way to do it would be like make your own FPGA. And just feed all the signals in there. The FPGAs that have that many input channels nowadays. So it's, uh, it's not quite off the shelf, but it's, it's, it's getting there. But uh, doing like an FPGA development is probably like another like two, three year project if you just have the time to like to go into that. But what we want to try is we want to try like a smaller array, perhaps like a five by five, because we, we do have uh, two 60 channel boards, so we have 32 two channels available. So we, we probably want to try out all of these. Um, I'll be doing this at the moment. This. Um, Full scheme would be 16 plus 16, and then you have the gamma detectors too. So you probably do something like 14 by 40, 40 plus 14 rows and columns, and we probably do something like 5 by 5 for every pixel and just see how much, how, how does the scaling work, and, and especially for the rate. I mean, that's, that's what you gain here. You, get a, you can go to higher rates on the right side compared to the left side. So this is what we have. We made a, our own uh, readout board. So you can see that all sorts of surface mount detectors, uh, resistors that connect things in these rows, and then at the end there's a, a row here uh, and, a, and up there that connects to the four corners. There's a small preamp, and then you go out from here into your uh, digitizer. Uh, another thing we can the, the PMT has, I mean, you can also get a, a timing signal out from the dynode before the last dynode. And the nice thing about that is it doesn't have all these resistors in its chain, so the, this gives you an RC delay. So all the, the rise times are and the, the fall times are a lot, uh, lot longer for like for the four corner signals, and so we use this to get the good timing signal. So, and so any, anything I present today is done with this board. And then we also have already a, a breakout board that we really can get access to every single pixel, and be, be designing a board for this row and column reader to the moment. But we do at the moment. So we have uh, every red star is a pixel. There's a one kilo ohm resistor in between. And there's a row of resistors at the end that actually varies. This is like a, the row, so we start off with zero, and then it's kind of a quadratic function. So it goes from uh, zero, hundred, plus a hundred, plus a hundred or so. Plus a hundred, plus two hundred, plus three hundred, so it's like a quadratic function. Uh, and then we have hundred ohm resistors on the outside, and then it goes to the four corners. And everything is uh, with the ohm terminated at one point. And this is our preamp here uh, that we use. Uh, with a little bit of filter. Uh, and I come to why we want to filter this. So I actually want to slow down the rise time a bit um, so we can get better time resolution for our digital detection. And I'll talk a bit more about it in a minute. So we get these four signals from the four corners. And this is actually our real signals. And the uh, time scale is like these are data points. So each data point, uh, we have a 500 megahertz scope. So it's, uh, this is like four, uh, four microseconds, I guess. Uh, 2000 times 2 milliseconds. Uh, and you can already see like the timing signal is a lot faster than these signals. And then we just do very simple maths to get out uh, the position in x and y. Uh, and with that, we get, um, for example, uh, what we did, you put mass in front of it and a radiative source. And then you get, uh, you nicely see all your single pixels. And we also have, a, we have another mask where we change the distance between these pixels. And then uh, this, is, this is from here. Same here, and this is the distance, so we, we can kind of resolve 0.4 millimeter on the other detector, which is a lot of, I mean, a factor of two smaller than what we need. We want to do it one millimeter, so we're very happy with how the system turned out. Uh, and, uh, 
the program is called Roots, so that's why like, he also started playing around with it. Always he was not going to like, spend an hour or so to like, hammer these small holes into the, into the foil and then should spell out the program name. Uh, these are the detectors that we have. It's a 5 inch uh, sodium and a 3 inch lentil bromide detector. Uh, as you can see, the lentil bromide gives you much better energy resolution and also better timing resolution. But uh, the drawback is it's, uh, it's although it's smaller, it's like four times the price. And so it's also, we were not able to get anything larger than a 3 inch lentil bromide. I guess they have larger ones nowadays, but it's, they get really expensive and like really only times. And so we settled for like more or less large speed would buy, which was a 3 inch and I could go my detector. Um, to digitize, we use this um, commercial system. It's from XIA. They're sitting there in Hayward, so like not far away from here also. Uh, it's a 16 channel, 5 megahertz, as I mentioned. It has uh, 4 FPGAs. Each FPGA handles uh, 4 clocks, I mean 4 input signals. The FPGA, unfortunately, is uh, slower. It's at 100 megahertz, so it has to handle like 5 data points each, each clock cycle. Which it does, but it makes uh, for some awkward mess if you want to pin things by three or something like that. And it just like uh, gets um, already got like sometimes in our way of like uh, getting to the, making things nicer, but it's, uh, that's what we have at the moment. It, it does offer um, an energy readout automatically, and it, it can handle pileup, so it still records like the right energy even if it sits on top of a decaying pulse, and it's, uh, uh, it does sub timestamp resolution, so you get. Um, I think they demonstrated after that kind of picosecond with the 500 megahertz block. Uh, and so you can also record traces, but if you record traces, this thing sort of slows down a bit because you have to shovel memory back from like, the car to the computer, and then during that time it's kind of dead. And so uh, you really want to run without like the recording traces at the end and just put everything on the, on the FPGA. So this is like the how they do the energy. So they have like a this is your signal, and let's assume there's like another signal that sits on top of the uh, an exponential decay. So they, they keep running sums like, from their input signal over like a certain length, L. And if you have several of these running sums, um, if you need three, you can figure out, uh, and you know the decay time, you can figure out what amplitude is here, uh, what this area J is, and what your baseline is. So you have uh, three running sums, three unknown parameter, and you can just, uh, assuming it's a nice decay, you can just fit it. Uh, and just like some simple mass and you get out your energy, like the shaded area here. That's what you use it in. But it also means that you have to you can optimize all these parameters, L and like uh, you can actually have several distance. They they're somewhat independent, you know, but they have the same number here and, and so, so now we have to optimize all those things and that's also not turned out to be, be not as easy as we thought it would be. Um, for the timing uh, we do something similar than con uh, what people used to do with constant fraction. So normally people um, took a signal, they inverted it, they delayed it a bit, and then you add them up together, and then you get a zero crossing, and uh, that zero crossing was your constant fraction time. Um, and uh, so we want to have a nanosecond time resolution, and, and uh, what's implemented at the moment is something more con like similar to constant fraction, just a digital uh, form of it. So this is what the, what the instrument does. Um, has a, actually it has like, it like has two ways of doing timing. It has like, so we have the, the raw signal here. It's an example of we measured with the nitrogen chromite detector. Then it does what is called a fast filter, where it just uh, it does this mass, so it integrates over a certain time, like a, over like a L point, and it subtracts like a, another L points that are shifted by like a, by a gap. So like if you if you integrate it say from here to here, you would just get your energy. And then the second one here would, uh, would subtract something out here. So you kind of subtract the baseline. So you're, you're left over with like, the energy of the pulse. Um, and, and you can do the same thing if you do like really short integration. You can get you can get a timing signal out. So you can, you can set a threshold somewhere on this, this signal. So they don't set a threshold on here. Uh, the advantage is that you have a bit, um, you have a bit less, uh, well, I mean, like a, it's not advantage like doing digital because like if you do this digital, uh, this is very easy to do on FPGA. It's just uh, adding things up, and thresholding is very easy. Whereas like uh, multiplying, division are hard on an FPGA, so like uh, try to avoid doing that. And for the constant fraction, they're taking this signal, which is this one here, and they take the same signal, which is just like this one delayed by like another constant like B, 
uh, and they subtracted them, and that their weighting, weighing one was like a constant omega. So it's similar to constant fraction, but not exactly the same. And so here, for example, the green one is the pass filter, and the orange one is the constant fraction uh, signal. And then you set a threshold, and then for the constant fraction, you take the first zero crossing after your signal crosses the threshold. So that, that's our timing. So it's somewhere there. And um, now you can optimize those parameters. Uh, and uh, that's unfortunately not that, not that easy in our case because some of them are hard coded, so we have to go into the firmware. Um, but since we can record traces, we can do a lot of this in software, so we, we spend quite a bit of time trying to figure out for like traces that we have, how does our pass filters, you know, pass infection looks like, what's the best um, threshold that we want to have. And the way we did it is we put a sodium 22 source between our two detectors. That gives you 511s at the same time, and then we can do coincident measurements. Uh, and that looks something like this. So if you look at the constant signal, uh, with the system as it is now, you get the uh, photos have a maximum of a few nanoseconds. And then if we start like playing around with different settings, so like most you went to the effort of like, I'm not sure how many points are this, like a few hundred. Uh, each point is like the photos have maximum at a different setting. Uh, but we vary the parameters. And uh, somewhere down here, we have really good ones. And we picked some that actually are somewhat noise tolerant. Um, we got the best uh, results of ours, like uh, we reduced by almost a factor of two, like that. So we're getting better time resolution just by changing the way the concentration is calculated. But you have these extra parameters, and you can optimize them, and you can principle. There might be an energy dependence, like you maybe optimize this for like 511s, but you want to really optimize it for carbon, which is 4.4, and the alpha, which is also higher. And um, that's something we're working on at the moment. Uh, so then we did some carbon measurements. Uh, so uh, we used uh, here, up here is our neutron generator. We used some neutron shielding and some lead bricks to shield our detectors. And then we put just a, we're playing around with the moment is a, it's just a block of carbon, it's like several inch thick. Uh, so it's uh, like a foot wide and then uh, several inches of the cross. And that's very useful just to get our first API measurements done. And so if you just look at the, what the natural bromide measures and you don't do any API, you get something like this. And then uh, if you zoom into this area here, you see that if you take the carbon, if you put the carbon block in or take it out, you, you nicely see the carbon peak here and the escape peak here. And the rest uh, is pretty much the same for most cases, so it's just our background. And we see some other elements too uh, over here. The rate is pretty low, but we also operated at a low voltage at the time. Um, and then the next thing what we, what, we, what we did is we started using the API information. So you can use the timing between the alpha and the gamma, and just look for, make a small coincidence window where you say I want to have one alpha and one gamma. And uh, I don't know, I, I put the gamma like 20 nanoseconds behind the alpha, but the window might be two, 40 nanoseconds would be used. Uh, and then suddenly you can throw away lots of signals because they, they come from somewhere else, from, from a different depth. Um, from like the cement in the ground and uh, other things. And so and you can see that our, our background dropped a lot. Carp peak is uh, suddenly looks a uh, much better signal to noise. Um, and the other peaks are not really, it's just like the background is dropped by, by, by a good amount. And so that's really what you want to do. And then the next thing you do is, you do the same thing. Um, so here's the distribution of the arrival times, for example. You can see that's where the carbon block is, and probably here is our floor, um, where we have cement. Uh, and then you add the XY position from the other detector to it. So like, this is a top view, like the, like the carbon blocks are somewhere here. Uh, and you add it together, and then you get this 3D plot of uh, lots of, in our case at the moment, we have the stage where we just have point clouds. And you can see like there somewhere here is the carbon block. And uh, this is where the neutron source, uh, source sits, and our detectors are left right of it. So that's, uh, we only got this like a two weeks ago, I think. Uh, and it's still optimizing parameters on it. So that's kind of where we are now. Uh, so the next step is you want to, there's a lot more optimization and an endless list of things you want to do uh, to really find good entropy. You see where, how far we get. Um, and hopefully soon we're going to start measuring soil samples. Uh, how much time do I have? 10 minutes? Right. So I'll talk a bit about this. Yeah. Yeah. Talk a bit about simulations and let's skip a few slides. Um, so we did a lot of simulations at the beginning. So like, uh, this is just what I talked earlier about. If you have a resolution of 
the millimeter up here, and you have a certain target width here, and you can easily calculate what uncertainty you have here. So if you have a millimeter resolution up here with a two millimeter target, you get like five centimeters on the ground. So that's where our five centimeters come from, and we measured. So we already we already good because we got like 0.4 millimeter up here, so we should be should be okay here. But then you can do simple MCMP simulations. So we just simulated some soil uh, with a carbon block in it, just so we have something to look at. Uh, and uh, detect the source, um, plot all like the neutrons, like where they come out, and the direction of particles, just to convince ourselves that we did the right thing. Um, then you can bin it. And so here is something where you can see uh, what the detector sees. Like the, most of the signal comes from near the detector because it's just closer. And then you can also see the carbon block, and you can actually see how it's grading across here because there's also some shielding. Uh, but now in the simulation, you have perfect. Uh, um, so what we can do now, we Simulation gives us a timing when the gamma detector detects it, gives the direction of the neutron, we can calculate where the alpha is, and we can start like playing with arrows. Like what, what if our alpha detector uh, nice, uh, has a has a certain uh, certain error? And so this is without errors. Uh, so the only error you get here is from Newton scattering. So then you can do plots like this, where you say like a so I reconstruct where I think my uh, my carbon is, and, but I know where it is in the simulation because MCP reports it. And then you can figure out what is the error and how much of my how many percent of my um, signals have what error. And so it's just a histogram of, of errors. We want to be red line is where we want to be. So if you have perfect information, perfect time resolution, you still get like a centimeter error just from Newton scattering events and other events in the soil. But most of your signal is just uh, it's, it's within the five uh, centimeter error. So if you then um, so if you then start adding uh, errors to it, so we added like a one, just a one millimeter error, Gaussian error on the other position, and on one on the second on both of the detector timing, you see that it um, gets much more fuzzy, uh, but still like a good amount of our signal is within the five centimeter, but that that error start, suddenly starts to, to grow. Uh, and so then you can um, then you can take this percentage that you have there under the curve here and uh, make a plot versus like the, the errors that you have. So if you, the top is the Gaussian error in time, it's the blue curve, and here's a, the like a Gaussian error in position. So like it's a sigma of the error that you had, and this is the simulation we showed, and we're getting roughly 90% of our signal is from the it's like an error that's smaller than five centimeters. So we're quite happy about this. Uh, and even if we, if we would have larger errors, it would still be like uh, up in the 80%. So we should be able to tolerate some larger errors if it comes to it. The other thing you can do is you can look at weights. So we looked a lot about um, what happens if our neutron weight goes up. So like you have events where like you have one alpha and one gamma in a certain time window, which is what you want, but you would have two gammas, and then you can't tell which gamma belongs to the alpha, and more or less have to throw these away, or you can have more likely two alphas and one gamma the same thing and so you can have all these like you can have a background like an uncorrelated gamma just happened to arrive at the time where you think I mean, where there was an alpha and so like these are all these events like a uh, color up here and like if you go up with your weight at one point like the amounts of, of good signals which is the blue one here will just start dropping from like almost 90% or so like down to like zero relatively fast so that's why with API you can't really go to higher higher rates you just limit it with the, with the weights and then just the MCMP simulation um, so this is just like a kind of small Python script. Uh, then the simulation we kind of we look at this too, and we get, we get a very similar curve. And so we are operating somewhere here, so we should get uh, the high 70s to 80 percent uh, good signal. Um, and so like there's also a lot of stuff to do on the simulation. So I'm going to the detector response. We really need to simulate our uh, test end now to like we have to understand our data better. So that's things that we have been working on at the moment. Um, and so we have our first week to do reconstruction measurement, but we have to do a lot more on it. Uh, lots of optimization for the data system. Plan to start soil experiments soon. And hopefully like in half a year or so we wanna we wanna take the system into the field. So we have we have a lot of things to do like, in the next half year. So that'll be gonna be an interesting project. And I quickly want to mention other things that we do in our group. So there's a project that uh, we we'll are building a compact accelerator, so it's like a it's paper based. So we have this beam that's in here where we can accelerate beam like that goes through each, each of these vapors uh, and we add um, a few kilowatts per vapor. So you, we, we had a three-year project where we showed that all these things work. We have some 
tiny quadrupoles that are uh, micro machines in here uh, for focusing, and we have accelerating gaps. Um, and here's a, a, okay, one of our articles we published uh, with the cover on RSI. Um, and now we have a follow up program where we want to build something like this, which goes up to like a meter, where we can go up to like 100 kilowatts of beam energy. So that's, that's the goal of a pro project that just starts, for example, if you're interested in accelerators. Um, and, um, one application is to make a nice neutral generator. If you have 100 kV, you can multiple, multiple beamlets, uh, so you can scale the current up. That's a nice thing about this approach. If you want more current, you just add more volts. And should scale uh, up to a certain size of the linear, um, then, you, um, then you get there. The, the other thing that we have is also we have, a, we have a larger accelerator. This is like an 11 meter machine, and it's the X2. Um, I won't go into that much detail, but it's a, it's a 1 MeV helium beam that has a very short pulse, it's like 2 nanoseconds, 10 nanoseconds, and a relatively high current, so I get amps of currents. So it's a very unique machine in that, uh, that sense. I'm only doing radiation defect studies, but it's, it's a machine that's also available at, at the lab. Uh, and we always open up, uh, open for opportunities. Um, probably going to get some capsule on students on campus uh, to work on uh, both of the RE project that we have. Um, so we also open for other collaboration. So what is ultimately are you? That implies that you're just going over fields. But yeah. the first picture you showed in the demo, there was the forest. So we um, when so we work. In, so like, there are several applications for it. Uh, one is for agricultural. One is more for like um, earth science people, like not necessarily for agricultural. Um, we work. The people we work with, they have uh, access to fields in the forest, and they know the soil very well, so it's all pre-characterized. So it's a, it's a good benchmark for us to go there. And so that's probably why we're going to end up going there. But um, uh, it depends a lot. Also, like what, I mean, like, so there's several applications we have to pick, like a, what, what we're aiming for, because um, it depends also a lot, like how long, how the system will perform in it, and we don't really, we don't really know that as well at the moment. And so, um, yeah. Okay, one, one, I mean, uh, uh, 38. So early 38, you were the first demo. That's kind of the best case scenario. Like you have a carbon clock. Yeah, that's a that's, that's uh, like I mean, you want to start with something. Like yes, <laughs> well, that's the best case. That's the best case, yeah. And so, um, but it helps us a lot to like understand our system because like I mean, there's already some stuff like if you don't if you don't understand in this. There's like there seems to be a lot of uh, bits on this side. I mean, it's closer to the detector, but it's still it doesn't really there's nothing there. So we don't, there's things we don't understand. Once uh, yeah. and we're going to use that to figure that's it out. to be understood because this yeah. is the best case, and you want to see punk. Yeah, and this is pure graphite. And yes. All that gets there's nothing around it, and later we're going to have a, a, a mixture of um, different elements and yes. like one percent carbon, so a factor of hundred less. It's the best yeah. case. You don't have anything to vary from other isotopes. Yeah. So that's the other concern, of course. Is if you look at the spectrum, yeah. even if you have time of flight, the reduction is like a factor. It's not order than anything. Yeah. And if you have a lot of background to deal with, yeah. which is so. Yeah. So that, a lot of work to be done to yeah. understand why is it only why it's not better. I mean, this is also like uh, the reason, only reason it's not better is because it's, it's a short measurement time and we ran at low Newton output. So we didn't run at full Newton output uh, uh, at the same time, we would have gotten like a tiny amount of data. Uh, but it's enough data for us to go through kind of hand by, by, by hand and like figuring things out. And you're using time of flight for this? Using time of, yeah, this is time of flight. And, and you know the position, so you're setting the time of flight according to the position of the clock. Yeah, so like, th yeah, that's kind of what we're going to do, but we haven't really done that yet. So. So this is just pure 
there's like a z scaling in this thing. So it's like there's an offset in time that we have to take into account. Okay. So five centimeters resolution isn't going to let you image roots. Yeah, so so there's no point to get any input, it just copies the nutrient. So it, right. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, so if, if, if that's not particularly useful, why are you box like this space at all? You could almost have a proximal imager, and then you could spend less time per region, especially if it's mounted yeah. on a truck. So, uh, I mean, one thing that's interesting is, is was depth, because that's really hard to get to at the moment. And that's where you, that's where the, that's where the information is in. And we might get away from having like x, y, perhaps we just, perhaps we're going to integrate more about x and y, and just focus on the depth. But it, um, there's also, I mean, people are in like the x, y distribution too. It depends a lot of like who you talk to, like in their science, for example, what they want to do with it. So there's, there's, there's several applications in some, one of the x, y distribution, some are not that interested. Is uh, absorption of the uh, of neutrons into the uh, into the carbon an issue? Is it, what's the relative cross section between the, the uh, um, scattering and absorption? Actually, I, I don't know, but it's not a big issue. I mean, um, the bigger issue is if you when look at soil, is that you have you have wet soil and you have you have water above it, which will uh, uh, scatter neutrons. Mm -hmm. That's 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 all. That's one of our main concerns and how to handle that and how to um, estimate the water content. Some probably something probably we would like not to do, but we probably have to do to like understand the spectrum we're measuring, and so we're looking into that. You have the two, I mean, you have the two point two. Yeah, so we have the right. yeah, we're getting hopefully oxygen, hydrogen, um, and water content. Oh, you, so you mean the you mean the thermal neutron capture in carbon twelve? The cross section is very low. It's like why they use it in like reactors. Carbon twelve is pretty low. Okay, and 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 the fast neutron. Will the, the inelastic scattering actually be quite high, which is the one that we're looking at? Yeah. Like hundreds of million bars. Right. So, that's it? Okay. Right. Thank you.